Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Off Farm Income Podcast. Hey, thank you so much for joining us here on our YouTube channel for episode number 939. Well, hey, today we get to interview another national proficiency winner. We're going to be speaking with Andrew Mayhus, and he is coming to us from the University of Wisconsin. Now, he's got a very interesting placement SAE working on an elk farm. Now, he's been doing it for about four to five years. His responsibilities have really, really progressed, and it's inspired him for his career, for his future career, and he wants to work with these animals going forward in the future. It's a really, really cool interview, and we're going to get it started for you right now. Andrew, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for coming on today. Hello. Thank you for having me. Hey, you bet. It is my pleasure. I am very excited to speak with you about your supervised agricultural experience. I have... I know of this business. Uh, I live in Idaho, and we have people with this business, but I've never spoke with anybody who does it, let alone an FFA student. So it's going to be very interesting. Can we uh, can we start off just by kind of getting to know you a little bit and uh, asking a few questions about you? Sounds great. Okay. Okay, so you are currently studying at the University of Wisconsin at uh, Stevens Point. Is that correct? Yes, it is. I'm studying wildlife ecology and management. Okay, very cool. How long have you been out of high school and now in college? Uh, this is my sophomore year of college now. Sophomore year, okay. And you just recently were awarded the 2020 National Proficiency Award in Wildlife Management, is that right? Uh, specialty Animal Production. Oh, sorry, Specialty Animal Production. I got it mixed up. Man, congratulations. That's pretty incredible. That's a great accomplishment. Thank you. Yeah, you bet. And I'm excited for you. This is a super unique project, so uh, very, very cool. Okay, oh, yeah, so it's very fun. Okay, so now I, I normally ask all my guests if they live on a farm or if they live in town or something in the middle of those two. Based on your project, and I'm teasing this, by the way, for our audience, based on your project, I'm assuming you live out on a farm. Uh, I live in town. This uh, I got this job through my ag teacher. I was kind of looking for work, and okay. we live in a small town, and the farm's right in town, just like off on the outskirts, and Asked her about it, and she recommended me for the job. Oh, very cool. So this is actually, is this a placement SAE then? Correct. Oh, very cool. Okay, interesting, interesting. All right, so this is a placement SAE, and, and when do, when did you start working there? How long have you been there? Uh, I think this will be my fourth or fifth year working there. Okay. I've been working on and off through college too. Okay. What's the name of the uh, of the farm that you work on? I work on Neitzel's Village Elk Farm. Okay, so you've been there for, did you say four to five years? Yes. Very cool. I got the job after freshman year of high school. Okay. Okay, so you live in town. You're working out on that farm. What got you into the FFA? Uh, my mom was really big in the FFA throughout high school. And like when I was joining in seventh grade, she recommended I had seen her plaques at my grandpa's farm and kind of always wondered what it was and you know, what, like how she did and what, like everything was with FFA. So I was really excited to join and then got really into it throughout high school and did a lot. And okay. I really enjoyed that. Yeah, very cool. I see that you wound up as your chapter's president. I did. That was my senior year. Um, I got voted in as president and it was a huge honor. I was the first president who wasn't a returning officer ever. Oh, really? Um, for our chapter, which was a big honor that I was trusted with that responsibility by the other officers. And um, we did a pretty good year. We had our record um, fruit sale. So that was really cool to lead. Awesome. awesome. So that's it. That is a big honor. So what was the situation that that propelled you into that position, you know, in an unprecedented fashion like that? Um, I just kept running for office. I didn't got in the year before that. Okay. So I kept running, kept trying and, um, my friends all recommended me as president because um, they said I had really good leadership skills. I had done other, um, I was president of my 4-H for multiple years. So mm -hmm. I'd run an organization similar and they thought I'd do a good job. So they voted me into the position. Okay. So persistence. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> good for you. Well, that's awesome. I'm happy for you. That's, that's very cool. And then uh, you chose to go to the University of Wisconsin, Stevens Point. Is that close to uh, Fountain City, Wisconsin? Um, it's about three hours away. Three hours I'm away. Mid middle of Wisconsin right now. Okay. And so you're able to maintain your job at the elk farm uh, even being three hours away? 
Um, I'm not there a lot right now, but on breaks and when I'm home on the weekends, I'll go over and help okay. um, feed the elk. And if um, last year when we started our Corona cation, you know, <laughs> right. um, my boss had to have knee surgery. So I took over a lot of responsibility then um, being the main one feeding and having someone else help me do the feeding and where he was not able to. Okay. Got it. So you're able, so they understand you're going to get your education and they understand, but you're uh, able to go back and work when it's, when you're available. Yep. One of my friends kind of took over my position there and helping feed and everything on the weekdays and weekends. So when I'm available to help, I do help. Okay. Awesome. Well, good for you, man. That's great. Well, let's do this. I always love to acknowledge our FFA advisors on the show. How many did you have uh, there at your high school? I, uh, we had one advisor through all the years I've been at high school. She's been at my high school for, I think, 20-some years or more now. Um, she's a great advisor, Christine Jumbuck, um, an amazing advisor for our chapter. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for mentioning her. Let's talk about your supervised agricultural experience. So obviously it's working on an elk farm, but there is a lot of detail that goes into this, I'm sure. So uh, let's start off like this. What are your responsibilities there working with elk? Um, so when I started out, I was mostly opening gates and like trying to keep the elk in the um, pens and feeding. As I got uh, more experience, I started with the feeding, actually driving the machinery. We uh, feed large square bales to our elk. Mm -hmm. um, and then grinder mixer, we use an oats and then protein pellet combination, which they eat. Um, and then as I started to get more and more experience with it, we started, I started helping with the velvet production and cutting. Okay. which is our main business, along with selling animals here and there to uh, uh, meat production. Okay. Interesting stuff. So as you started off, you were just handling gates. Why was it, I guess, to be able to feed, why was that as you got more experience? What was it you needed to learn to be able to do that? Um, growing up in town, I'd never really driven a skid steer or a okay. tractor or any of that. So I didn't know how. So working through on the job, I got to learn more and more, and they slowly taught me to drive the skid steer and tractors. And uh, after I kind of learned that, then I was able to take on more with the feeding. Okay. Now, when it comes to your gates and your fences, how tall do they have to be to be able to keep the elk in? Um, our gates and fences have to be at least eight feet high. Um, the elk can jump pretty high, actually. So you have to have a lot taller fence than with a cattle because... Mm -hmm. And elk will jump over it. We have to have um, telephone poles as most of our posts. Wow. Because the elk will snap posts over. Hmm. Um, they're very strong. And when the bulls are shedding their velvet, they need to rub their antlers right. to clear that off. So they'll shove over posts when they're doing that. Okay. And are these Rocky Mountain elk that you that you raise there or is it a different variety? Uh, they are. They are a strain of Rocky Mountain elk that um, we've slowly accumulated more and more over time. Mm-hmm. After the initial buying, um, I forget what year the farm started, but after they initially bought the elk, um, we haven't really brought any more elk into the farm. Mm -hmm. It's just been um, inbreeding and building up a herd that way through the cows that we have. Got it. Okay. And do you know how long, uh, I'm going to try and pronounce it, Netzel's uh, Village Elk Farm, how long has it been in existence? Um, they've been in, they've been running uh, elk farms since uh, i think it's been over 20 years i know that for sure okay. like it's like 23 years or so oh, very cool now uh so rocky mountain elk eight foot fences what is the main product that uh that they're raising the elk for our main business is the velvet production so the minerals inside the velvet um, get used in a lot of different pills and supplements um so about half Two thirds of the way grown of the velvet because each year they regrow their antlers. Mm -hmm. We cut off the antler like um, almost like a tree, so you get just a little um, stump that's left. We call that a button. Okay. Um, we cut, then we freeze that velvet and the minerals and all that inside is ground up and made into different pills. Um, they help a lot with like muscle tears and things like that. They help with the healing because the minerals in there are good for um, like growing new tissues mm -hmm. and also like getting more blood to an area. So that helps a lot patching um, injuries. And then also I know it was recommended after cancer treatments. I think I read one place um, to just help with the blood flow and like expanding muscles. It also, I know, I think helps with uh, arthritis. Okay. That's interesting stuff. So do you have to remove the horns then before the bulls are able to rub off that velvet? 
Yes. So about two thirds of the way grown, um, we'll cut that antler off. We do keep some bulls around to kind of show off as show bulls. And then also to grade, like if we're going to switch herd bulls, Mm -hmm. um, for our south breeding, but we cut, I'd say 95% of our bulls and all that is left is about a two inch stub of the velvet after it's cut. Okay. Very interesting. Now, is there, is there other sidelines going on for revenue development on the business? Like, is there any agritourism or anything like that? People coming out to look at the elk? Uh, we don't have a lot of, like, we don't do a lot of that. Like people will stop on the side of the road and look at the bulls and mm-hmm. kind of look over Cause we are a very unique business, especially in Wisconsin. Um, but no, most of that. And then we do sell some elk for meat. Um, they sell pretty good, two to three dollars a pound for hanging weight. Okay. On average, I'd say. Okay. Yeah, very interesting. Two to three dollars for hanging weight. Uh, so, uh, obviously, your your main product is coming from the bull calves. So, when you have a when you have a female uh, calf, what do you do? You do you just raise her for meat? Do you raise her to be a replacement? I don't know. Do we call elk, young elk females heifers? I don't know if we call them that or not. Um. They're heifers up until they become cows, so it's bulls and cows that we have uh-huh. on the farm. Um, we raise all the cows up um, till, to breed more, so that way we can keep our numbers up. That is how we expanded our herd. We are a closed herd system, okay. so we don't sell animals except for uh, meat production. Mm-hmm. And other than that, the, all the elk stay on the farm. Okay. Um, so each cow is raised to be bred, and then we also bring in semen so we can keep that gene pool up and uh-huh. not have uh, genetic suppression throughout the herd. Okay. Got it. I was wondering about that. As a matter of fact, that was my, my next question. So you beat me to the punch. Very good. Uh, okay. So you've got the elk, uh, you're using AI. Now when it comes time to AI and elk, or when it comes time to remove antlers, what kind of equipment do you use to, to control them? Uh, my boss actually designed and built, he owns a metal fabricating shop in Winona, Minnesota. Um, to design and he built his own chute that runs on hydraulics. Mm-hmm. It grabs the elk around the midsection and that has two arms that come and squeeze around the neck and then we can lift that elk up. So they're kind of off their feet more. So they can't throw themselves like throw their body weight around okay. and move and damage anything because we can't use like a normal cattle chute. Right. Because with the antlers, we can't fit them through that. Right. Yeah, so that's interesting. So the way he developed the chute, obviously the elk can walk into it without the antlers hitting on anything. And yep. then it can grab a hold of them. So then what kind of an alleyway do you use to get them into that chute? Uh, we have a shed that's set up completely with six different like sorting pens. So we bring all the elk in and then we sort out bulls because we don't all cut our bulls at the exact same time. Okay. It's kind of over a month process. We work every Friday and we'll cut a couple of elk that are ready and then the rest go out to pasture to wait another week. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of a process to determine then. So we sort them out in these little, I'd say 10 by 10 pens with swinging and sliding gates that we can move elk in and up. And then we bring them into the chute, um, tie them down with two harnesses to each side, lift them up in the air and then we can cut. And then the back has a gate that opens up so that we can reach in for AIing. Okay. Got it. Now, when I've uh, dehorned in the past, and I've only dehorned cattle, uh, but when we've dehorned mature cattle and they've got they've got horns, you know, once you you cut those horns off, uh, there's quite a bit of blood. Um, and so I'm wondering how that is with elk when you do that. Is it similar? Yes. So one thing is we're not trying to damage the next year's growth. That is that'd be a very bad thing to do for our elk, especially. Uh-huh. But when we cut, the growing antlers are basically a large blood vessel. So there's no nerve endings or anything up in there. So when we cut that off, it is a very bloody process. Um, The elk do lose a little bit of blood. Um, So we have blood stop there, like the powder. Uh And we put a paper towel over the top and rubber band that down on top of the, um, what we call the button, which is left. Mm -hmm. And we spray fly spray on there to keep the bugs off there. Okay. So there's no nerve endings there? Nope. Because these grow every year, so they don't um, wouldn't want to put nerve endings up through there because they drop off every year and regrow. Okay. So that'd just be extra cells that they'd have to put up through their antlers. Okay. Man, that's going to make that a lot more pleasant than it was when I did that with cattle. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we have elk that'll just stand there and barely move or blink an eye when we cut off their antlers. Really? It's mostly just the fact that we have them like, contained and there's 
humans leaning over and yeah. like kind of grabbing and touching stuff. Man, it's got to be strange for that bull when you release him. All that weight that he had <laughs> above his head is now gone. Oh, yeah. It's very funny, especially like we let some bulls grow out, you know, to look at them and have to show off for herd bulls. Uh-huh. And when they do drop one side, their heads will lean to the like empty side because all that weight is gone. Yeah. Yeah. They've been compensating for it. Now it's not there. Yep. Huh. That's funny. Okay. So we know about that now. Elk antlers can be sharp. Like there have been, well, I've seen plenty of videos where two bull elk are fighting and one actually punctures the other one with a horn. Uh, I'm assuming you guys have to have some extra safety precautions around these bulls if they get spooked, if they get aggressive, something like that. Yeah, it can be very dangerous working with these elk. They are very large animals and they are very strong. So it is always a uh, top priority to be safe. We're always trying to stay in machinery, like not trying to get out of like the tractors or skid steers as mm -hmm. little as possible. Um, one thing is elk, they do not like stuff above their head. So that is one like safety feature. Like if an elk is kind of getting near you and kind of being a little bossy to put something up above their head, like I'll take my hat off and kind of put it above their eyes. And that'll usually back down an elk if it hmm. is kind of getting a little closer and aggressive. Um, it's a lot of body sign reading because with feeding, they do get really close because they want that feed. Mm -hmm. So you kind of got to be able to read the elk, um, determine if they're just wanting the food or whether they are, you know, kind of getting ready to attack. Mm -hmm. um, that's come through a lot of practice. I've kind of learned and uh, read some mistakes, but definitely gotten better at it and been able to read these elk. Um, but with the velvet cutting, we cut most of our bulls. So a lot of them don't have antlers. And the ones that do are bulls that we try and um, have trust in. Okay. So like our herd bull, we want to breed for a little more, um, less temperament, you know? So our herd bull now, we trust him a lot more than most bulls. So every year in his antlers, we aren't as worried about him attacking. Okay. Hmm. Yeah. Fascinating stuff. Where's your main market? for the antlers is it is it asia is it here in the u.s where's it at um a lot of it does get shipped overseas um but there are some companies throughout the united states that do produce a lot of these pills and um supplements around the united states i know wapi labs is a big supplement um provider but a lot of it does get shipped overseas and used in different asian medicines okay yeah interesting i live in idaho and i'm not too far i'm about uh, six hours from Jackson Hole, and you're probably familiar with that, but the, at least when I was going to college in Montana, the Boy Scouts every year on the elk range out there, they would gather all the antlers, and then they have a big auction and sell off all the antlers as a fundraiser. And, man, people came from all over the world for that. Oh, yeah. It's very cool, especially, like, because we'll have a couple each year. So if we have a pile at work that we can look at and kind of, you know, look back at the old bulls, we also try and score them every year. Okay. To determine breeding processes for the next year. That's interesting. So you're scoring the bulls. So is there an average score on the farm or do you have a record? Like do you have a, a bull from the past on the farm who's got the record for the for the highest score? Um, our bull right now, Ruffy, I think he um, got, I think it was 435 inches last year. Whoa. Which is a very big bull, yes, but we're it is. my boss wants to breed for a 500 inch bull, <laughs> so he's bringing in semen from a lot of these bigger bulls to try and raise um, elk up there. And we have some really big ones this year because um, we were unsure on the velvet market. Yeah. So we let a few more kind of bulls that we were questioning whether we wanted them to be our herd bulls of future or not. Mm -hmm. So we let a couple of them grow out, and we have uh, quite a few really nice bulls this year. Wow. So just to let everybody know who's listening. So I've lived in either Montana or Idaho since I was 19 with a, a brief stint of of uh, going back to California for like two years. And so I've been hunting elk that entire time, and I've gone on some really, really great elk hunts uh, in Idaho and Montana and in Nevada. And uh, the dream on these great elk hunts is a 400-inch 400, uh, 400 elk. And you've got a four, – did you say 430? Yep. Wow, that has got he's got to be awesome. You got a picture of him somewhere? Oh, yeah. I can find some, yes. Yeah, I'll, I'll have you send me one and we'll put it on the website. That'd be that'd be awesome. Wow, that's a big bull. Very cool. Well, man, this sounds this sounds really really cool. Uh so over over the years, how is your I mean, your responsibility now. When you first started, you're just working gates. Now here you are, you know, 4 or 5 years later. How have those responsibilities changed? 
Um, I've gained a lot of responsibilities. I started out like that, but um, last year, especially when um, right before co- uh, the coronavirus kind of took over everything and shut mm-hmm. everything down, and like our car- college sent us all home for online learning, my boss had to have a knee surgery. He had to have a knee replacement. Mm-hmm. And when I went home then, like first the two weeks before that, I went home on the weekends and was helping feed because he couldn't drive tractor or skid steer. So I was mm-hmm. in there helping and doing all that. And so over that summer and through that, that spring and summer, I did a lot more work. I was one of the, I was the main person doing all the feeding versus being the helper. So I had like almost had a role flip from what I was doing. So I took on a lot of responsibility during that time, especially. Okay. Yeah. Very cool. Well, so looking at your major, uh, which is wildlife ecology, I'm assuming that this job has inspired you somehow with what you're studying in college. Am I right about that? Of course. I mean, my dad works in the natural resources field. Okay. And I kind of always wanted to work something natural, natural resources, but then starting this job with the elk, I especially fell in love with the elk and would love to work with elk in the future. If I can, Mm -hmm. um, I'd really love to work on the Wisconsin elk relocation project that's happening in Wisconsin at this time. Okay. Um, that'd be my like my dream job if I can, but I'd love to work with elk or another large animal like that. Yeah, that's interesting. What is the Wisconsin Elk Relocation Project? Um, elk were basically hunted and like completely removed from Wisconsin. Okay. And they have slowly been reintroducing the herds. Um, they have two herds, right? Main herds in Wisconsin right now. Um, there's the Clam Lake and the R- Black River Falls herd. Okay. And they they allowed their first hunt two years ago now. And they're starting to build up the herd, and it's a really cool project. Um, so you can actually hear elk bugle hmm. in Wisconsin that aren't from like our farm. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, very cool. Now, were they introduced those elk? Have they had any issues with depredation from wolves? Uh, I do not know, like entirely. I don't think they have too much of a problem with it, but I'm not entirely sure hmm. to be honest. Yeah, that's really interesting stuff. So that's your dream job, and you're after a, a four-year wildlife ecology degree, or are you going to continue on after that? Uh, four years for now. Uh, the future might, you know, prove sure. different, but as of right now, that's the plan is four years. Well, that's great. Well, tell me about uh, winning this national proficiency. That must have been pretty cool. Well, it always, like, been my dream to compete at nationals at some in something. Um, I've come close before. I won – uh, wildlife state, but wildlife did not move on. Mm-hmm. I've taken second in parliamentary procedure, forestry, and then third in environmental natural resources. So I've been really close multiple times and was finally able to uh, win with my proficiency at state, which was an amazing accomplishment for me. I was extremely happy to just to do that. Then rework on the proficiency for months, mm-hmm. send it into nationals, and then it was amazing to get to um, – hear about it on uh this like zoom calls that they did for that mm-hmm. and then actually to win was just an amazing accomplishment for me that's awesome well hey congratulations on that are you going to carry that forward are you going to uh see if you can become an american star finalist next year uh i might look into it i have to talk with my ag advisor and just determine if i want to try and run for that or not yeah it's more paperwork <laughs> Oh, boy, that's always fun. <laughs> Very cool. Well, Andrew, I'd love to get your advice for other students out there. I mean, you have obviously made the best of being in the FFA. You've been very active, very involved, uh, but not growing up in a traditional sense on a farm. What would you say for other uh, incoming freshman students around the country who maybe live in town, they don't live on a farm, uh, what would you say to them about their opportunities through the FFA? I'd say just try everything you're um, willing to give. There's something in FFA that you're going to find and you're going to like. Uh, my ag teacher, she kind of recommended me for stuff. Uh, we had parliamentary procedure in the classroom, and she kind of signed me up and said, you go try out for the team, like see how you like it. Mm-hmm. And I fell in love with that. That was my favorite contest to compete in. Um, so I fell in love with that just by a recommendation. I never would have thought of trying it. She recommended me for it um extemporaneous speaking i did that she just she just signed me up and told me to do it and i really enjoyed that um wildlife just tried and all of a sudden like i'm winning state with that forestry it was a backup plan because i'd won wildlife state so i just tried forestry i fell in love and it helped me through college 
um, in my forestry class, I learned already had learned a bunch of the stuff. So that helped me with the classes. So you're going to learn stuff and you're going to like it. So just try and sign up and do it. Hey, that's great advice, man. Thank you so much for coming on and sharing this today. It's been great. Thank you for having me. Well, thank you for being here, everybody. Thank you to Andrew Mayhus for coming on the Off Farm Income Podcast today. And as always, enjoy your journey to the ultimate lifestyle business, agriculture.